Hello, welcome. Uh, let's get full screen here for, yeah, the second part of Roman, ancient Roman art. Well, actually last, uh, last Monday was Etruscan and uh, early Roman art. We're gonna now talk about the period when Rome dominated the whole Western world, what was then the Western world, three continents. We'll get to that in a minute. But first, for those of you who were, uh, uh, logged on and waiting to join, and uh, I think it was four people, uh, judging by the numbers that I saw at the bottom of the screen, just like it is today, only eight of whom were able to come back. That glitch, I had nothing to do with it. It was Zoom. Zoom said a problem has occurred with uh, whatever service or something like that. So that's why I had to go back all the way out of it and then re-enter, start a new meeting and forward the second. Uh, as some of you who joined know, but if you missed that lecture, because understandably you might have thought I wasn't going to be able to, to do that, to get back on uh, to Zoom a second time, uh, it's full lecture, didn't miss anything. We covered all the slides we were, we were supposed to cover, and that'll, of course, be posted on uh, YouTube by uh, before 8 p.m. on Friday, probably soon. Okay, just for you to know, because if you wonder what happened, the material is there, just uh, will have to be watched after the fact for those of you who uh, didn't uh, rejoin. Okay, but let's, there's no wood in this office. But yeah, there is right up above me. That it doesn't happen again. I, I think it was a glitch. I haven't had that happen where I'm booted out of what it had nothing to do with the weather. Maybe it was the uh, traffic on the internet from, you know, the crisis that's happening in Ukraine. I have no idea. Okay, so let's get right to our first must know slide because we have a lot to cover. And I think you'll find this is pretty interesting. Much of this, you're gonna see these uh, slides uh, illustrate why the Romans uh, were so influential, not only in the ancient world, but how some of their architectural and technological inventions we still use today, including this first must know slide. Let me just make sure, can everybody see this? Yeah, right? Yep. Yeah, good. I just need one person to say that. Okay. So here we go. All right. Uh, this is um, <clears throat> Pont du Gard. It's, it's the next one below the one we finished with was, of course, the, the, the uh, well, actually, it's above it. <laughs> Augustus the Prima Porta. I wanted to establish that because who was he is very important. He's uh, that slide of the statue of the first Roman Emperor Augustus. It's all, of course, on the recording for Monday. Uh, was the first Roman emperor and set the tone for the next five centuries. That's how long the Roman Empire lasted, 500 years. As an empire, it had been around as a small city-state and a kingdom before that. Okay, so here we go. This is uh, the first must know today, Pont du Gard, three words. P-O-N-T, middle word D-U, and the last word is G-A-R-D. Okay, the location, there are several of these uh, relics or, or remnants is a better word. Remnants, of, I'm not sure why that's in there. Let's get rid of that. Okay. Um, which are remaining sections of aqueducts. And that's our first definition today. I'll get to it in a minute. But let's get you the location. If it's on the test, of course, you'll have this syllabus to look at. If it's on the midterm, it is Nimes, N I M E S, it's a town in France. So Nimes, France, both the town and the country location, 15 AD or CE. Okay, this is one I'm not going to cut from the study list. Um, anytime there is a slide, I almost always remember to say it, but if for some reason my memory slips a disk or whatever, and I don't say it openly, if there's a slide where a definition accompanies it, you could almost always count on the fact that that slide will not be cut from the study list, not saying that means that it automatically will appear on the midterm. There's only eight slides on the midterm and on the final. Um, but but it, it wouldn't be removed to study list. I'm not going to remove this one. It's it's pretty important. Okay, so let's start with the fact that this is the largest remaining section of a Roman aqueduct in Europe. I think there are longer sections in Asia and Africa. You know, the Roman Empire spanned parts of three continents, almost all of Europe, south of you know Scandinavia, and uh, all of North Africa, all of the Middle East, well into what's now Persia. 
it's a huge empire. So I'll say it again. The, the most important fact about this is it's really unusual, is that it's the longest surviving segment or, or uh, section of an ancient Roman aqueduct, which was what is an aqueduct. So let's now do the definition. You see it's there below the list of things invented by the Romans, which I'm gonna mention in a minute. In a minute. So one or two of those things. But first let's do the specific definition for aqueducts. Okay, the, this is a system for carrying water from the mountains to a city. Okay, invented by ancient Romans, comma. It's, it's, sorry, it's not that long, it's medium long definition. I'll say again, the first part. A system for carrying water from the mountains to a city Invention, invented by the ancient Romans, comma, in which uh, gravity is used to conduct the water through a series of conduits supported by arches. That's what we're looking at. Again, conduits is the only word. They're not pipes. Pipes are enclosed. These weren't enclosed. Okay, again, Anybody need to repeat that? Um, well, the second half, I'll repeat it. Uh, in which, right, I already repeated the first half once, so second half, in which gravity was used to conduct the water through a series of conduits supported by arches. Well, we're looking at the arches, that's obvious. The conduits you can't see. Let's get up a little closer. They're in the uh, three levels buried into where buried sounds like they're hidden they're not hidden they're open to the uh the air now in some places in the roman empire like in africa where it's hot all the time or in you know scotland in the very northern part of the empire where it's cold a lot they might have enclosed those conduits and then of course that you could call those pipes. But in italy and in france and in most you know spain and most parts of europe most parts of the empire they were open, you could say troughs, but that's misleading. A trough is, it doesn't really get the idea across. So conduits is the only really correct word to use. So the water, you can tell, let's go back to a view, is, is trickling, right? Flowing, you could say flowing, downhill. The mountains are obviously, it should be obvious, on the uh, far left off the edge of the picture, many miles up into the mountains is where the water came from. We still do this today. I think everybody knows that California is one of the largest aqueducts in the world now. And it's the same system, the same concept, the same technology from over 2,500 years ago. The Romans started using these long before they became an empire. So we, we still have those things today. That's why I put that on the list of things invented by Romans. Concrete also didn't exist before the Romans invented it as, as a material for building. Of course, it's still used today. Domes. Definitely a Roman invention. Uh, obviously, buildings all over the world have domes. Colosseums, everyone's now, I shouldn't say it's many of you have been to a Colosseum, right? In California, maybe the one in Oakland where I used to watch the Oakland A's in the World Series when they once went to the World Series on a regular basis. That's a long time ago. That's, of course, patterned after the first, well, not the first, the, the most famous we're going to see today, in fact, Colosseum in the world, the one in Rome which wasn't the first Colosseum, it was the biggest. So Colosseums are a Roman invention. Triumphal arches, we have a definition. I'll give it to you when we get to a slide of one of those. We should get to that today. Now the interstate road system might surprise people because that's what we have all over the United States and many parts of uh, you know, developed, let's say industrialized countries, whatever phrase you want to use, where they have enough infrastructure to actually need uh, be able to construct and, and connect roads that they need to, 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 to link the different parts of the country, a kingdom, uh, a nation. Well, the Roman Empire had roads all over every part of the empire, even in the desert, which if you kept, it's a famous phrase, some of you may have heard of it, all roads lead to Rome. That's only slightly exaggerated because once you got to the Mediterranean, if you were in Africa walking, riding a horse along the Roman road, you might have to take a boat to get across to the European mainland, or you could go all the way around through the Middle East, through Turkey, and, and then you still have to take a boat to get to uh, Greece from there. Point is that the road system connected every part of the empire. And that idea, we obviously have that all over the world today. 
it, the first the culture to do that was the Romans. Okay, so let's talk about the rest of the meaning of this. This is about um, this segment. You can't see all of it here. It's about a quarter of a mile long. That's a long chunk. There are parts of aqueducts by the dozens all over the former Roman Empire on three continents in North Africa, you know, in North Africa, in Asia, as you know, right? Everyone knows the Middle East is Asia, part of Asia. And of course, all over Europe, all the way up into England. Scotland. So, so aqueducts with these conduits, there are three levels which the water would have flowed downhill, supported by, of course, rows of arches. There actually is a better word for that. It's arcades, but I don't want to get too, too uh, technical. So we'll just say arches. It, it, those hold up each of the levels, the three levels. There's another fact, though, that's maybe even more amazing about the fact that it even survived than that fact. And that's it's still being used today, not as an aqueduct. No, they have much more modern, you know, updated technology. And of course, France is an advanced country technologically. I mean, they they have, you know, modern aqueducts just like we do here in the United States and much of the rest of the world. So what do they use it for? Uh, foot and vehicle traffic. It's a bridge connecting the two sides of this river which is outside the city of Nîmes. Nîmes is an ancient Roman city. I've been beautiful, about 200,000. They're the size of Santa Rosa, in fact, they're very close. Good sized city and uh, they use this, the people in that city when they want to, this is the only bridge, they actually have more modern bridges. But it was still, when I was there, um, let's see, that would have been in the early aughts, the last time I was in France, this was still being used. I hear they've closed it to vehicle traffic because it was starting to shake it, the, 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 the stone work too much. But that's only on the bottom level. So here's, you could just say it this way. The bottom level of this aqueduct or former aqueduct uh, is now used for uh, foot traffic and uh, some vehicles. I think it's just bicycles and motorcycles now. But I saw school buses with 50 school kids on a field trip, French, of course, school kids, get all out of their bus and walk across this with their teacher, you know, explaining how it worked. And it's fascinating. I mean, it's a functioning uh, bit of infrastructure 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years after it was finished, even though it doesn't carry water anymore because it's not intact. The part in the mountains just fell down a long time ago. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning of this. So let's do a formal analysis. It's balanced, completely symmetrical, left to right. And it depends on what you think of as where the middle line would be. But if, if you draw it here, this is thicker and wider, this is thinner, but I'd say the mass of these archways is about equal above and below. Uh, but some people would say because of the third level that it's unbalanced at the top. That's, that's up to you to decide if it's on the midterm. The rhythm, obviously powerful, repeated shapes of piers. That's what these are called, piers. It's the only word for these. These are in columns, piers structural elements that support the arches. So the piers and the arches just repeat over and over. Of course, they're dynamic, the arches and the piers and the conduits, right? The three levels on it are all stable. So it's both. It's a warm color and the texture is only real rough texture of stone. The modeling, of course, you can see is from the shadows of the sun. And here's maybe the most interesting thing uh, when it comes to space. It's 165 feet tall and a, qu a quarter to a third, it's somewhere in between. So say over a quarter of a mile long. That's a pretty impressive because it keeps going well beyond these trees and beyond this uh, edge here. <clears throat> so about a, you can say about a quarter or a little over, a quarter of a mile long by 165 feet tall. Of course, that's the real space. And the largest mass, so that's easy. The bottom row of arches then the middle row and then the top row. And the line is all visual line, of course, uh, around the edges of the arches. Okay, I can't remember if I'll see, because I alter my syllabus uh, in small ways each semester so it doesn't get stale for me to say exactly the same thing on each of the same slides. I don't think I put this in. So you guys are getting a break, you can just listen. This is amazing. This is actually my own slide. Um, this is in Pompeii, so it's not on test. So you don't have to write any of this, but it's it's almost it, 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 it's hard to explain how disturbing is the word. Disconcerting would be another word. This room was when you know what happened in this room. It's in the basement of a villa in Pompeii. That is, of course, one of the 
thousands, and I do mean thousands of Roman houses and villas that have been excavated over 250 years. They've been digging up Pompeii. They're still working on it. It's one of the, the larger, well, I don't know about larger, one of the most prosperous cities in the Roman Empire. Everyone knows what happened to it, right? I don't have to explain that. When the volcano erupted, these things got uh, uh, buried in ash, not lava, ash. <laughs> And then eventually, perhaps some lava flowed down there, but uh, that's what killed everybody was the uh, poison gas and the ash from the volcano. But this room before the uh, volcanic eruption of Pompeii was the scene for horrible abuse of women, children, young boys, any vulnerable uh, person that this group could, well, kidnap, whatever, you know, grab, take away from wherever they found them and bring them and they probably uh, were locked up, up in the basement. It was called the Dionysian cult. Based after we talked about who Dionysus was, remember the ancient Greek and Roman god of wine. So what happened here, these are uh, future victims and initiation candidates. So the adults are voluntarily joining. This group was so over the top in how they abused, especially young children, both boys and girls. Every, I don't want to say, you can guess, in every way you can imagine, that they were outlawed. The Roman Empire, which wasn't known for its moral conservatism, right? Their origins and things are not myth. They, they did have orgies among the upper classes, at least. Even among the upper class Romans who were used to having all kinds of orgies. This was over the top. They outlawed it, uh, the Roman Senate. And so it was an underground group, literally underground. This is a basement of a big villa and all kinds of unspeakable uh, things happen. Like this poor girl here is, has to read something and she's about to get uh, abused in ways we don't need to think about, but unfortunately still happening. And then this woman here is dancing for people. Maybe she's a slave, perhaps, or a servant. And then on this wall, we have this guy here who's, you know, obviously enjoying some pleasures of the flesh. Okay, so this is a, a very famous room. It's amazingly well-preserved. Just one section, of course, probably damaged by the heat from the volcanic ash or lava. Everything else is intact. It's and it's a beautiful example of Roman fresco painting, even though the scene is despicable. So. Uh, I think this is one that I left on the list. I have to double check. Uh, no, actually I took it off because of the amount of time we have. We do want to do, uh, if time permits, well, no, next week. Next week we will do the uh, slides, my own slides of Rome when you want to take it. Down. Okay, but again, I'm giving you guys a break. You don't have to take notes on this, but this is an example of the superiority of Roman frescoes. And in fact, one fresco is on the list that we're gonna see it next, cityscape. Like why don't we just take a quick look at it? We'll talk about this, but I wanna give you a point of comparison. Okay, first, this is in Livia's house. Livia was the most powerful woman in the ancient Roman empire, period, of over 500 years. She's the only one that had some actual power. She wasn't a ruler, she was the wife of Augustus, his second wife. You may have heard of her. She is accused by many historians of poisoning all of his natural born children. <laughs> so her son could become an adopted son. We covered this, remember, in the last slide at the end of the lecture on Monday. Augustus uh, named in his uh, will uh, his adopted son, Tiberius, to be his successor. But he didn't do that until after his own kids died under mysterious circumstances. Food poisoning, accidents at sea, um, or I forget, two or three, uh, at least three of his family members that he wanted to become his successors, his blood relatives, who would have been in line to be the next emperor. And they all disappeared in certain uh, mysterious circumstances. So we don't know if she had them killed, but there's some very incriminating evidence. It's, of course, what we call circumstantial evidence that she may have engineered those deaths. In any case, she succeeded in becoming the mother of the second Roman emperor and through him, she had a lot of influence. Um, okay, so she was Augustus' wife and each of them, almost all the Roman emperors, this was true of. They, each one, the wife, you know, the empress uh, who had no power under most of them, but this woman did, as I just said, had more power than most women ever had in ancient Rome. Whether they had power or not isn't the point. The point is they each had their own budgets, their own staff, their own group of uh, servants, of course, and their own house. They didn't live together. Roman emperors and their wives almost always had separate uh, houses. And that's what this is. This is a wall fresco 
uh, beautifully preserved. Look at it. It looks like it's just been finished painting with just a few little scrapes here and there missing. It's the scene you can see if you stand on a hill in Rome and look out towards the ocean. Uh, there's a mountain range that, you know, is pretty much on three sides of it, where it almost surrounds the city of Rome. And that's what this is. These are the mountains in the distance. I think you can tell it uses atmospheric perspective. Well, uh, I think this is not overstating. The Romans are credited by many historians, again, you have to know this was there, with inventing the technique of abstract perspective. They were the greatest fresco painters in the ancient world. Nobody debates that. They even may have conceived in some textbooks, I think including Stockstead, almost say they had actually developed scientific perspective. Why? Because this is obviously foreshortening here on this uh, fence or wall, I guess. Uh, and there's diminishing size, and we already said atmospheric perspective and overlapping, of course, here. Again, you don't have to write any of that, but it has the appearance of though there's a vanishing point, which would be beyond the mountains, of course, you know, or well, on the mountain range behind this tree, if there was one. But it's been x rayed, you know, they didn't actually draw lines. So this say they had the concept, um, they, they conceived the idea. Uh, it's of the best of the Roman uh, fresco painters, not all of them. The next slide, you'll see why I say that. But this guy must have been one of the best. Well, of course, he was working for the, the wife of the emperor. So she had to pick, I'm sure, the best fresco painter she could find. Uh, this fresco painter understood the concept, if not the actual technique of abstract perspective, I mean, of scientific perspective. But he definitely used, or she used, atmospheric perspective. Beautifully done. Like early morning, you know, when the sun is just rising. It's, it's really very realistic. Even down to this... Uh, wooden slot fence, you know, like red, the redwood fence I have in the back. Okay, let's move on to the next must know. This is a must know. Okay. This is just one word. The title is one word, cityscape, just like it sounds, cityscape. And the location is a city in Italy. A city in Italy, Boscoriale. I'm trying to say it like an Italian word. I have friends in Italy, but they always laughed at my pronunciation. You know, at least they provide you try. I think I've said that before. If you're in a foreign country, if you even don't pronounce it correctly, but you make an effort, most people you meet in the streets of the cities overseas will appreciate that. Okay, so spelled the one word, of course, uh, B O S C O R E A L E, Boscaria. 30 BC or BC. Okay, so this is a Roman fresco. I'll repeat. The parts where I said in the last one that you didn't have to write down, but now you, you should. That this is an example of the skill of Roman fresco painters. They were, there's no debating this, the greatest fresco painters in the ancient world. All of their cities, in all their provinces, in all parts of the empire, there would be a group of trained fresco painters or a studio, actually, you know, right, that would produce these frescoes on demand, of course, for, for pay. <laughs> So skilled fresco painters lived all over the Roman Empire and you can find Roman frescoes in every part of what was once the Roman Empire. This one is in the countryside, Boscariale is well, okay, a small town in Italy, it's nowhere near Rome. But look at what the scene is. It's part of the city of Rome we're looking at. So that's the major part of the meaning. I already mentioned though, don't forget that if it's on the exam, you'd wanna start or at least include in the meaning paragraph on the midterm of this slide, that this is an example of the high level of skill of Roman fresco artists and that they were the greatest fresco artists in the ancient world. So let's take a look at what part of Rome would this be? Well, we know it's the Palatine Hill. You don't have to know how to spell that, but if you want to, I'll spell it for you, P-A-L-A-T-I-N-E. That's where all the senators and most of the wealthy people in Rome lived. It was above the Roman form. It's a hill above the Roman form. You can just say that and you don't have to use that word. And we know that because even though we couldn't tell that from these houses, these houses, look at this. This is the Circus Maximus. Circus Maximus, which was where the Roman chariot races were held. You don't have to have seen Ben-Hur. By the way, the remake was a little lousy. <laughs> the original one from the, the late 50s, I think it was. With Charles Hesson is a well-made movie, fairly accurate in terms of its uh, you know, uh, historical detail. Ben-Hur, you know, based on a famous novel. 
Um, okay, so that's of course mythical, but the race scene is not at all exaggerated. They did use spiked wheels and all kinds of other contraptions to try and disable their competitors. But they were the most popular sport in Rome because gladiator combats, people might think they happened every month. No, they only happened a few times a year. It was a lot of work and a lot of sacrifice, a lot of money to set up a gladiatorial combat. But chariot races would happen on a regular basis. And there were teams from different cities, you know, of course, competing. It was a major sport there, about like soccer is now in Europe. Okay, so what we have was their largest amphitheater for outdoor, you can say auditorium, but it's really not an auditorium, outdoor amphitheater for sporting events. It was not the Coliseum. That's pretty big. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But uh, this was much bigger. This could hold at least 200,000 people. The circus is like it sounds you know, the word we use for circuses means something different today. Circus, second word, Maximus, M-A-X-I-M-U-S. That meant the largest racetrack in the Roman world. That's it right there. So we know where this was, this view. So what are we seeing here? Then we're seeing a wealthy Roman, upper class. We know he wasn't a senator, but <clears throat> powerful, wealthy Roman. who could afford not only a villa in the countryside, that's where this is. But he had one in Rome. So he had his urban villa and his rural villa, or his city villa and his country villa. So he's in his country villa thinking about being in his city villa. So he wasn't very Zen, if you want to follow that train of thought. But here's what he's doing, showing off his wealth. He's literally just reveling in it. No one who wasn't very wealthy could afford every one of these details. Even one of them would be expensive. You start with a marble column with red, very rare marble and gold, real gold uh, embossed into it. That right there shows he's wealthy. This is you know, a detail that, of course, would have been in front of the entrance. That's what this is, the main entrance to his uh, villa in, in uh, Rome, his urban villa. Then we have the bronze doors. Look how detailed and decorative they are. Those doors would have cost more than most Roman you know, citizens earned in a lifetime. And then the actual entryway is made out of marble. But the most amazing detail, very important part of the uh, meaning, is a window with full glass panes. Only a few people could afford that. Some estimate as many as 10% of the people in Pompeii, because it was such a wealthy city, might have had glass in their windows. But most historians think it was a lot less. And in Rome, it certainly was less. Rome, Rome had 2 million people, by the way. That, that's, that's a big city today. <laughs> But in the ancient world, nothing, nothing came close. The next closest was uh, Babylon with about a half a million in its golden age. So 2 million people, a huge population, and most of them were working class, poor, or maybe you know, a quarter of them perhaps were middle class. None of them could afford glass, at least not in their windows. That was the luxury item. So that's part of the meaning of this. Now, no one uh, today yet has asked in the past class, who asked, well, what is this? Some of you may know, you don't have to add it, but it is part of the meaning. That's a tragedy mask, which is a contrast to the comedy mask, the two types of plays they had in both ancient Greece and Rome. And they used this kind of, a, you know, just a mask or face, you could even say face, which actually some of the actors on stage would wear an actual mask with either a smile or a frown, depending on whether they were, you know, in a scene that was tragic or, or supposed to be comedic you know, a comedy scene. And so that's the tragedy mask. I don't know why he chose that instead of the comedy mask. Okay, so there you go, pretty much the whole meaning here. So for oil, one more thing. What kind of perspective is used here for space? Well, this overlaps, of course, into the formal analysis. But it's important to mention, this artist did not know scientific perspective or atmospheric perspective, because this, the structure here, the, the columns on the Circus Maximus should be shown in blue hazy look because it's like a half a mile away up on a hill, you know. So it would have had a hazy look in, in, in any other, uh, you know, more uh, realistic fresco scene. So he didn't know atmospheric perspective and we assume it was, in fact, I think we have some reason to know that they only hired men to do frescoes, at least in Italy itself. In any case, we'll just say the artist was not skilled in two techniques that some others were, as we just saw with this. Some fresco artists in Rome itself were skilled in doing atmospheric perspective and a freehand version, that's how I'd say it, of atmospheric, sorry, I meant scientific, I'll repeat that, 
as you see from the Casa Livia fresco, the previous one, that some Roman fresco painters did know a, a, a freehand version or understand the concept, you could say it that way, of scientific perspective, though he didn't have the actual technique. This guy didn't know either. So what techniques does the former Romans now, does this actually use? Well, there's overlapping, that's obvious. All works of art that show more than one object since cave paintings did that, of course. So that's nothing new. Foreshortening, yes, that's pretty well done. And I would say diminishing size. Those are the three techniques because these the roofs and balconies on these houses get a little smaller the further back you go. And there's foreshortening, obviously, on the columns. And the row of columns is called the colonnade. You don't have to know that word. A row of columns is, is narrower as it goes further into the distance, as is this balcony here, if you look closely, it has foreshortening. So that he knew how to do, this, this artist. Overlapping, foreshortening, and diminishing size. Those are the only techniques for space. There is superb semantic texture, and that he, he, this artist is the equal of all the other uh, well done Roman frescoes on the marble, on the bronze door, on the glass in the window. You can even see the reflection, a little bit of the sun there, and the curtains behind it. It's beautifully done in that regard. And this column with these gold, right, gold leaf, it's called, you know, where they actually put gold, not just paint, but actual gold is hammered into the surface of, in this case, the marble column. So that's all realistic cement texture everywhere you look. And the colors are mostly warm in the foreground. Um, this is kind of an off yellow as bronze would be. But you could say that in the middle ground, there's some cool uh, stucco, white stucco in the middle ground on these houses. And then it's warm again on the, in the amphitheater and cool, of course, in the blue sky. The lines are all thin. The largest mass, it's a close call between the column and the entryway to the villa. So you could decide that. And then again, you'd have to decide if you think this section of the wall, look, it's got, uh, oh no, that's that's not a crack, that's a bind where you decide. <laughs> not deferred maintenance. So maybe that's the second largest mass if you count it as the column being the largest, that's how I'd see it, and then the entry hall, and then this, the section of the wall with the window. Okay, and here we have, um, let's see, what we, oh, modeling. Yeah, the, here the modeling is pretty good. It's, it's, it's even on the column to some degree, and it's definitely on the entry line, uh, right? You see that between these, and so that forms visual line, by the way. And there's some modeling on the amphitheater on the surface maximus, and maybe this one balcony. So modeling is pretty accurate and, and strong and realistic. Uh, the rhythm is obvious with the arches, right, and the uh, columns, right, the windows, lots of rhythm. It is mostly stable uh, in the bottom half, and then it depends on how you look at it, but because these objects would be stable if you stood in front of them, but they fade off into the diagonal lines as a eyesight would see them. So in that sense, the upper half, I guess you could say, is mostly dynamic. And is it balanced? I would say it is. But there are people who would say, well, there's some empty space here. So in that sense, you could make the case it's unbalanced toward the left, but it definitely is roughly balanced top to bottom. This area is roughly equal to the area above the midline. All right, and real quick, another, you'll have to write this out. This is another fresco from Pompeii. It's the return of Hercules, according to their legends. He, you know, the strong man Hercules, who was a half God, half human, right? Like all heroes, returned to visit his mother, and I don't know if he's being shocked by his nudity or just that he's alive, probably the latter, because Romans weren't humble about human anatomy, as you probably already know from their sculpture. So what do we see here? We see, you know, her son returning after 20 years of wandering around the, what was then the known world and showed up, I guess, unannounced uh, at her house. And so she's reacting with, you know, surprise, shock, and maybe, you know, happiness. All right, this is a really important slide. Should be obvious why, uh, but if it isn't, I'll tell you right now that this is one of those that has much, a better than 50-50 chance of being on the midterm. And if it is, and it's on the slide essay part, which there will be three such slides, then you definitely want to have good notes for this, which of course you could take with or have with you, I should say, when, when you take the exam in front of you, obviously, and uh, use the notes I'm giving you for, you know, the essay meaning section of the essay, as well as the formal analysis, so we'll do both. Probably obvious what it is, but 
I'll spell it out for you. It's um, the Colosseum, C O L O S S E U M, Colosseum, Rome, and the date is it was completed in AD 80. Okay, it can be repetitive. AD 80, 80, and then you can say C E U. If you prefer. I'm going to tell you when you travel around, at least in Europe and the Middle East, like most, most countries still use AD and BC. Um, but that's, of course, changing. And obviously, here both are acceptable, in, at least in this and many other classes. So, whichever you want, I'm using the traditional method. It's, you know, the common error, as we mostly say now. What does that mean? 80 years after the supposed birth of Jesus, if you didn't know that, well, nobody really knows what year he was born. So, it's, it's all kind of educated guesswork. What we know is that it was the largest amp outdoor amphitheater. Okay, it's not a racetrack. So this qualifies as an actual arena. I should say arena, it's a better word. You can say amphitheater, either one will work, but arena is actually a better word, A-R-E-N-A. -E Again, I'll repeat this. This was the largest uh, outdoor arena in the Roman Empire. Not the first Colosseum, but the model for all the other Colosseums that came afterwards. It's also the other phrase for that is a prototype. This is a prototype for all the other Colosseums in every Roman province, there were Colosseums. Some of them were not very large, maybe only held a thousand people. So we're gonna to get to how big this was in a minute, but first some more facts about the meaning. And then I'm gonna ask people, I bet a couple of you will know something uh, surprising about this structure. So let's start with what is the most commonly cited information. We know it was the scene for gladiatorial combat, fights to the death, mortal combat, you could write it that way, and not to be confused <laughs> with the video game. I think that's still right. But actual live combat where one person didn't walk away, right, obviously. So uh, fights to the death between gladiators. We know that. Um, we also know that there were uh, horrible scenes of captured prisoners, Christians, some Jews, certainly some of the other minority groups in the Roman Empire that were subjected to, they were illegal for practicing a different religion, right? Um, they were subjected to torture and even death, actually usually to the death by either lions, eating them, right? Or being burned at the stake. This was entertainment <laughs> for some. Not everybody wanted to go to those events, but quite a few people did. They never had trouble filling up the Coliseum. Of course, it's 32 million people. Um, so many of them enjoyed this and they were free to the public. The, these uh, contests, or if you can call that a contest, when you're tied to a stake and a lion's been starved for a week and you're the only food. There's no contest, obviously. The person that's been tied to a stake isn't likely to survive. So anybody know anything else? Any other kind of events that were or even one other event that could have been held here? There's one that surprises a lot of people who wouldn't think of it. It's different than a gladiator combat. Anybody know or have any ideas? None? Nobody ever heard of the other? Okay. Mock naval battles were held here. They flooded the floor of the Colosseum. And this only happened a few times, but it's more than once. I read somewhere it was once. No, it's not true. It was done at least a few times, you know, in each, well, each emperor that lived long enough. Some of them didn't live very long. They were executed or assassinated. But the ones that ruled like Augustus for decades, at least several times during a long-term Roman emperor's rule, they would do that because it was really different. I mean, you're talking about actual real boats, not miniatures, with gladiators on the decks who then attacked each other with, you know, flaming arrows or whatever else they could to try and sink the other boat and then would try to, uh, you know, what's the word, land on the other boat, take over Right? The, the, the enemy's boat and of course kill everyone on board. So <laughs> those were really complex uh, events, but they happened a few times each, uh, each generation, let's say so, several times during the life of this building as a Coliseum, uh, there would have been um, mock naval battles, but much, much more common, at least more, more once every few weeks anyway, would be a gladiator contest that would last for days, sometimes weeks, 
depending on which celebration, which holiday they were celebrating, which religious holiday. They almost always held them on religious holidays or emperor's birthdays. And then I already said the third type of activity here was uh, the torture and um, killing of uh, prisoners uh, like Christians, some Jews, and definitely uh, enemy you know, soldiers and things if they chose to use them that way. And that was just you know, not a contest. But it was a form of uh, obviously extremely brutal entertainment. Okay, now the other thing about this. Now I have my own slide, so I have to remember that you guys in this slide is what you'll see. If it's on the exam, you'll have this view here. Okay. This here are some facts about the size. It's part of the meaning still now. That should surprise a few of you. Okay. First of all, it was 160 feet tall. We just said it was the largest Colosseum in the Roman Empire. 160 feet is like a 16 story skyscraper. Well, look at this city bus here. That's not a small vehicle, it's dwarfed. Each level was 40 feet tall, there are four levels. So you can do the math, 160 feet tall. So it was one of the tallest structures in the world when it was there, or certainly in the Roman Empire. All right, another fact about it is that it could hold with standing room only up to 70,000 people. And there are people who debate that and say, oh no, it was only 50,000. But they're not taking into account the nosebleed and standing room only seats, which were, of course, you could guess, like in modern Coliseums, way up at the top. And they did have binoculars then. So I guess you just were out of luck if you couldn't see who was killing who down below. But people did take those seats. So one, it was standing room only when this was this Coliseum filled to capacity with standing room only, it could hold up to 70,000 people. That's an amazing fact. Anybody been to the Oakland Coliseum? Hopefully one of you or something. Anybody, the Oakland Coliseum in Oakland, anybody? Yep. Yeah, oh, okay. What, what kind of event did you see there? I think, I, I'm pretty sure I was really young. I saw uh, some, sort of, some sort of old kind of classic rock band. Oh, okay. Yeah, they did a lot of uh, day on the green. They called them with, with seventies and eighties bands. Yeah, remember those? Yeah. And then in the eighties, Huey Lewis and the News. I've been there for several of those live concert things. And then of course they also had, uh, obviously the Oakland A still play there though. Who knows how long that'll remain? <laughs> There's a big debate of whether they're going to leave Oakland or not. Anyway, when you were there, do you, you probably it's too long ago. So I was like, but you might have a vague memory of. Did it seem full to you when you were there? It, it was it was full, yeah. It seemed pretty full because the, yeah, I mean, the rock was, concerts were were popular because you know they were back when tickets were like fifty bucks or so, or even less, uh, mm -hmm. and you could bring your own blanket and sit on the grass. At least that's how it was when I went with with several people, and the food was affordable. Yeah. So if you ever have seen even just you know photos or news coverage of the Oakland Coliseum when it's standing room only and I've seen it when it is during baseball games in the playoffs in the late 80s early 90s the A's went to the World Series three years in a row right got to see at least the playoffs on each of those three seasons and one World Series game in the Coliseum when it was full 50,000 people was the maximum you could cram in. That's covering the teams there, you know, uh, support staff, the press, <laughs> and all the standing room space. Add 20,000 more people to that, and it gives you some idea how massive the seating capacity of this structure was. So there's no contest about this being the largest outdoor arena or amphitheater in the Roman Empire. Okay, and then another fact about it, I wonder if any of you might know this, uh, what happened during the contests, uh, whether it was gladiatorial combat or sacrificing of Christians or Jews or whatever, uh, any one of those live events, when it started to rain, because it rains a lot in Rome in the summer, well, actually on and off all year. Anybody know what they did with the Colosseum during rain? Did they just stop the games? Anybody? Somebody must have heard this. It's pretty remarkable what they did. Nobody has read that, so I thought it was in Stocks but I haven't read that chapter so that's in a few, a few semesters. Okay, nobody knows, I'm surprised. 
they never stopped any of the games. They didn't have to stop any game on account of weather and also 110 degree heat in the summer with no shade. That would normally be a game canceling weather event in modern auditoriums or sorry, coliseums, not in this one. So this is an important part of the meeting. It could be the last fact you should have in your notes. They had permanently stationed hundreds of Roman soldiers d during, of course, events, not 24 seven all year round, but whenever there was a live event, Roman soldiers who were assigned this duty would stand along the, the upper level and they had ropes attached to a giant tarp made out of canvas with a giant hole in the middle that when they pulled the ropes, you know, drew them tighter and pulled them further away, it covered the entire Coliseum except the middle 30 feet because they had to have sun come through. In other words, they had a retractable dome or roof, probably a better word is roof. They, you know, nobody had that in a modern Amer uh, Coliseum anywhere until I think Toronto, wasn't it? The Blue Jays back in the 80s or something, finally built a retractable dome that could cover the Coliseum. And guess how long it took them to do that, the Romans, 20 minutes. So the most you get, if you were one of those poor Christians or you know Jews or whatever prisoners being you know, devoured by lions or about to be, and you prayed for rain, the most that would give you is a 20 minute delay on your death. <laughs> That's the longest day. It only took them 20 minutes. Modern Colosseums, some of them do have now more and more each year, I think, of the new ones, have retractable domes that takes them an average of 45 minutes to close those domes. The Romans had them beat by more than two to one. I mean, they could do it less than half the time. It's really remarkable. They figured out that from some kind of trial and error thing. And so they never had a game canceled on account of rain or uh, excessive heat, both of which are a problem in Rome in the summer. Okay, that's plenty on the meaning. So let's do a, a formal analysis. And uh, I'll do it slowly because there's, you know, oh, oh no, there is one more fact. I'm sorry, there is. Some of you noticed there's a section missing. Of course, you can see slides or photos, I mean, of this Coliseum from different angles where it's even more obvious. So here's, I should write this last fact about the meaning. About a third of the outer wall is missing, w roughly a third. Why? Anybody know that? Imagine, no, probably not. Unless, You've been to Rome and taken a guided tour, perhaps with a tour guide. Uh, a pope in the 1500s, one of the popes decided to take, I'd say steal, but whatever word you want to use, it was his own country, of course. Well, not technically, popes rule over a separate country called the Vatican. So just say one of the popes in the 1500s, or you could just say Renaissance, hundreds of years ago, if you prefer, uh, ordered the, uh, w those stones from a third one third of the outer wall of the Colosseum to be removed and used to build St. Peter's, which is the largest church in the world. That should give you some point of perspective on how big this structure is. If only a third of the outer wall only was big enough, I mean, had so enough stones to build the largest church in the world, which still is today, St. Peter's, it was a pretty massive structure second largest man-made structure on earth after the pyramid of Khufu. I, I, I could have started with that, but I just suddenly realized that's a fact that I don't usually mention. Pretty impressive, the engineering feat that they created this with their technology, I should say. And, and concrete was used here, right? And, and all kinds of other construction methods that we still use today. Okay, so that's why one third of the wall is missing. It's not that it collapsed or it was poorly constructed, not, not at all. All right, let's do the um, formal elements. I've already given you space, but I'll repeat it. It's real, there's no techniques. Remember these buildings, it's not about techniques for space. It's nothing to do with that. It's the actual real dimension. So we have it is 160 feet tall. It's an oval shape, right? Open arena, 160 feet tall with seating capacity for up to, or you could say between 50 and 70,000 if you want to get technical, but I'd say up to 70,000. Okay, um, actually that's not including seating because that's standing. So you could just say the capacity was up to 70,000. Okay, that's the size. And then we have the uh, dynamic versus stable. Well, if it's not obvious, it's both. Mostly dynamic people think that way because it's a, it's a curved, it's an oval actually shape, the building and each arch is obviously 
dynamic, but the columns are stable. So more dynamic than stable, but with stable details. The texture, there's no cement texture here. It's all the real rough texture of stone, but it would have been covered with marble and that was stolen or stripped off during the Middle Ages and the Renaissance by various uh, sorry, Pope cement to build other churches in Rome. So it would have originally had a smooth marble exterior cladding, it's called, right? But that's been taken off. Again, no, not because the construction was faulty. So it's now a real rough texture of stone. It's a cool gray or off-white gray slash gray color, not warm. It's warm on the brick, but that's on the inside, uh, the inner wall. And so the exterior, you can just write about that. That's most of what you see in this slide. It would have all been cool. The modeling, of course, is the shadows from the sun, the natural shadowing. And uh, then we have the rhythm, of course, the arches and the columns repeated over and over for this, this is uh, like the equivalent of about a two city block long structure and you can see the traffic goes right around it there was a subway you have to write this there was a subway station under they have a pretty active subway system in rome um but i think that station was closed at least that's what i read several years ago because the train rumbling was possibly been damaged Okay, let's see uh, what else. Oh, the largest mass. Well, there isn't one. They're all the same. Although because there's no arches in the upper quarter, the top section, you could call that the largest mass, but they're, they're all 40 feet high. So to me, they're all equal mass. It was completely symmetrical when it was new, totally symmetrical. Um, and the line is mostly visual line around the edges of each of the arches. And uh, yeah the corners. These are piers again. See, piers are what support arches and the weight above it. So columns, piers, arches, you've got, you know, visual line along the corners of the arches and the piers. Okay, uh, am I forgetting anything? Rhythm, balance, stable, dynamic. I think we've covered all. So let's, um, uh, let's do two more must So we might end a few minutes, all right. Okay, this is equally important. This might be the last one we do because there's a lot to say about this. This I have several views up for you. So I think you'll see how impressive it would be. I think I've, I know I've asked, but again, I have to ask one more time. Anybody in our Zoom class today here now, any of you been to Rome? You won't forget if you ever go to these places, they stay with you, the memory of them. I haven't been to Rome in decades, but it's still, I remember it like it was just a couple years ago. All right, this is the next must know. And here's another one I'm gonna give you a heads up right now. It's so important that not only will I not cut it from the study list, but it has a better than 50-50 chance. I'm not saying both this and the Coliseum, that'd be more things on Rome than perhaps, you know, a balanced selection of slides would warrant. But one of these two is very likely to be on probably the essay part or at least the slide ID part of the midterm and we will review for the midterm of course uh, because obviously uh, we're going to give you that uh, we're going to review for the midterm uh, March 14th and the midterm is March 16th right before spring break in case you didn't know or having to look at yourself is okay um, oh by the way I uh, I think I've said this but I almost forgot, I should say at the start, about the papers, that anybody who's submitting uh, a uh, late paper is only 10 points off. But the sooner you get them into me, the better it is for you for your grades for two reasons. One, you'll get them back sooner and you'll know your grade. And second, it doesn't back you up or, or lead to your know, backlog. They call it of, uh, too much work when you have two papers, both of which are maybe beyond the deadline and a final exam and perhaps in other classes beyond this one, besides this one. So that's not a good recipe for a good grade. So hopefully if you haven't submitted your paper, you'll get it in, in the next maybe several days or a week or so. And you know how to submit, I've already covered it. Okay, so what are we looking at? It's called the Pantheon, Pantheon, and that's P-A-N-T-H-E-O-N. -E and the location is Rome. 125 AD or CE. 
Okay, Pantheon, literally, to start with the first factory meeting, remember with a building like the Colosseum or this structure, a piece of architecture, the first fact you should have in, in both in your notes and if you write about them on either a paper or essay questions on the two exams, you should start with the purpose, the original purpose that this structure or building was created for. Well, this was the, quote, temple of all the gods, unquote. That's what the word, the Latin word pantheon means. The temple of all the gods, well, that gives you a clue, but maybe it's not totally clear. What does that mean? You could go inside this building and worship any or all of the gods in one place. That's not typical. All the other temples are dedicated to individual gods, as you probably recall from some of the Greek temples we've talked about. So this is the only building in Rome, and I'm sure there were others in other Roman cities, where you could go and worship any one or more. Uh, in any of the gods you wanted to, or even all of them inside one building. So it makes it unique. So that's what the word means, the, the title Pantheon. A couple more facts about it before we get into the specifics about what makes it literally mind-boggling, this structure. I mean, it's just people blown away when they walk inside. This was the largest domed building in ancient Rome, in the ancient Roman Empire. Because if we say Rome, it sounds like, oh, there might have been bigger ones in other cities. No, I'll say it again. It was the largest dome building in the Roman Empire, period. Nothing else came close. How big was it? You might ask. Well, you'll need to know if it's on the exam. The dome was 144 feet tall with about 142 feet wide. So say it was over. You could just keep it simple and say it was over 140 feet tall. We might as well be exactly 144 feet and over 140 feet wide, which means what? You could fit a 14-story skyscraper inside this building and it wouldn't touch the top. You'll see that in a few minutes. Now, the skyscraper inside this building, but how big it is. You can see why it would have been the largest dome building in, uh, well, the whole ancient world. You could say it that way, but certainly the Roman Empire. They invented domes, remember, and the dome is made out of concrete. So now let's take a look. There we go. Let's, whoop, whoop, whoop. let's take a look at that because it's part of the meaning. If that doesn't look modern and extremely uh, well maintained, it's the original 2000 year old concrete dome. They haven't had to replace it. That's how well the Romans built. I doubt anything we're, we built in this country or anywhere in the you know, modern world from concrete will last that long. They haven't had to replace it or repair it. I mean, just you know, some basic maintenance, you know, and cleaning and stuff. There's your other this next fact about the meeting is they had a hole in the roof. Why? Because that's where the gods could look down. Otherwise, well, how could you pray to them, right? You gotta be able to see them supposedly, right? If you believed in those ancient gods. So here are statues of some of the gods around the walls. And this was the opening, it's called an oculus, which is Roman for eye. You don't have to know that word, but if you want to write it, it's O-C-C-U-L-U-S, an oculus, or a 30-foot wide opening. You can say hole if you prefer. At the top of the dome was there so that people could look up and see the gods when they prayed to them, and vice versa. Of course, the gods could see them, the humans on earth, while they were praying to them. So let's go back to this, though, because I think this may be, in a way, the best shot. You see what you have here. This is a portico. We've already defined that term. Will definitely come up on the midterm. The portico, right? A column porch that is about 60 feet high. In fact, let's go back to the first view. If it's on the exam, this will be high. These columns actually have 60 feet. You see the people down there? I look at that. They're dwarfed by the columns. And then you go up above that about another 40 feet to the top of the pediment. So the entire portico is, is close to 100 feet tall. But look at when you see it in perspective from above, it's dwarfed. That portico is, is much smaller than the rest of the structure it's attached to. So that's called the drum, the round part, which the Romans used to create domes. The, the walls were, were you know, supporting the domes. So that's called a dome on a drum. And then they poured the concrete. It took several years in layers, which we still do today. They developed that technique that no one's improved on, that then was such good and quality concrete that it never needed to be repaired. And that's what we see when we go inside. Whoops, went too far. Let's go back to this. And here you see 
that's the concrete from the inside. And then the other things about it is still functioning as a church now. The Catholic Church owns and, and, and uh, maintains it or operates it, however you want to write that. They, they have a key that uh, I'm going to tell you when I show you my own slides. Uh, my own slides are this are pretty good. I think you'll enjoy those. We'll see those next uh, week on probably on Monday. Okay, so this building, just say it's been, you know, converted into a Catholic church and uh, it's been maintained or operated by the Catholic Church for centuries. So it's still a functioning building. But of course, most of the people that go there are not worshiping anybody. They're just tourists because it attracts more tourists than any other site in Rome except the Colosseum. But the two together are apparently the two most famous buildings, of course, in, from, from ancient Roman times. All right. And then one more thing about the, let's go back to the original view because that's what we'll do the full analysis. The columns are imported from Egypt. Like I said, they're 60 feet tall. So you can say that's part of the meaning. But this engraving here, the carving, however you want to call it, uh, is the name of the architect who worked for Augustus Caesar. However, this building was built about 100 years after he died. It was completed. So there was another pantheon in there, which is the last fact left to me to raise that there, well, there's one more, that this inscription, right, or carving on the uh, portico or above the portico it's all part of the portico here just above the columns that that gives you the name of the art you have to know it's a man named marcus agrippa but just say he was an architect who worked for uh augustus caesar and when that building was pulled down because it wasn't big enough rome had grown doubled from a million to two million people during that century after augustus died so they had to tear the old building was too small down and build a new pantheon so this is but they still they use that architectural design. So that's why those are the letters there. That's what that means. And the last thing is you might think, well, why is the, the, the why are the walls so, you know, kind of rough and not finished looking? That's not how it was built or completed. When it was completed, there was very fine marble lining the walls. Again, these popes started them in the Middle Ages. And we're talking about way back hundreds, several hundred years ago, like a thousand years ago, Stole. I don't know, you could say borrowed, but that's not the word. They never returned. All the marble off the outer walls of the Pantheon was taken off the un under layer of brick and used to construct, I think it's 10 other churches, smaller, of course, buildings all over Rome, which used the marble. So they made it into a, a marble quarry, in other words. It's, you know, typical of the way they, they didn't respect their own history, you could say it that way. But anyway, that's why there isn't any marble on the outer walls, when it would have been like the columns in front now are, of course, solid model. Okay, plenty on the meaning. Let's do a formal analysis and then I'll, we'll end early and I'll take questions. Uh, I wanna have to, you know, try and uh, rush through another slide. We have plenty of time to finish Roman art and do the review in the next three class meetings uh, and show you my own slides as well. Okay, so formal analysis, well, it's symmetrical, like almost all Roman architecture would be completely symmetrical left to right. But because the dome obviously is narrows at the top, wherever you draw the line top to bottom, I would draw it at the top of the portico. It's definitely weighted toward the bottom or unbalanced toward the bottom. Okay, then we have line. Well, here you've got a couple of kinds of line. You've got the visual line on the edges or corners of the facade, right? And around the um, pediment. And then you do have carved line. And absolutely, in this case, you'd want to put that in your notes because that's part of it, probably as far as the original design. Uh, all those letters are carved line. And then we have the modeling, very deep shadows from uh, the sun, of course. Natural modeling is used here or is created here by the sunlight. And then we have the texture is the smooth texture of marble on the columns <clears throat> and the rough texture, just the four areas. So smooth real texture of marble on the columns rough all the textures are real so you can just see rough texture on the pediment it's down there rough brick rough stone texture on the pediment and then rough brick again of course real texture on the walls and then real smooth concrete on the dome so remember this uses two techniques uh, construction methods invented by the Romans concrete and domes all right, and we have the rhythm of uh, powerful rhythm, of course, with each of the columns. And uh, you could say the decorative 
designs on the pediment and of course the sections of the concrete don't create you know circles uh, there's plenty of rhythm is it stable or dynamic well it's mostly dynamic of course the dome and the outer walls are, are curved uh, uh, but the pediment again it's both the, the columns are stable of course and then the pediment is both the bottom of that is of course a straight line that makes that stable and the upper two lines that meet at the top are dynamic so it's both stable dynamic on the portico uh, or on the pediment i mean and on the columns stable everything else the walls and dome are dynamic um let's see the largest mass it may not look like it but it's actually the dome and you can see that when you look at this slide i think um, well, some people would debate that. So you can say the outer walls and then the dome, because if you count the dome as just the concrete and not the outer edge. So we'll say the outer walls, I'll say it again, sorry, slowly. Three major or largest masses in this are first the outer walls, and then it's close second, the dome, and then the portico. For color, you can see that more, get up close. For color, you'd have to say that it's, again, both warm and cool, warm, on the brick, but cool on everything else. These columns are actually a cool gray color. They may not look like it from here, but they are stood next to them. So even though this slide, because of the sunlight, makes them look warm, they are actually cool. So the entire portico, including the pediment. So some people consider this whole thing the portico, but if you take the two separately, either way, it's all cool, cool off white or light gray color. Whereas the, the brick on the walls, of course, it's a warm red color and the opposite of the dome, it's a cool gray color. And uh, let's see that, I think, balance the rhythm, stable, dynamic, am I forgetting something, texture, color, well, oh, size. I, sorry, I already said it, but that's, that's the most important fact about a building is its dimensions. This is a large open domed room, single room, right? A large open domed room with a dome that reaches 144 feet in height. And you could just simply say it simply at uh, over 140 feet wide, the real space. And you could add the columns in front on the portico or 60 feet high. Plenty of notes on the meaning. I know I, you're not going to have to remember all that. I've said this before, but when we review for the exam, we'll take our time and explain. You'll see it's not going to be, you know, a two hour exam. Uh, and it's not going to require you to remember every fact I gave you from each of the uh, lectures on each slide that's on the test. And only nine, no, eight, sorry, eight slides will be on the midterm. And I'll uh, go over how to, you know, study and cut uh, the slide list by at least 30%. And we'll do that when we do the review and the definitions, the list of terms and all. I'll also cut that by about that same amount, about 30 or maybe 40%. So you want to be here for the review sessions, uh, which is the week of uh, March 14th, well, actually on the 14th. Okay, so we've covered quite a bit today and uh, we're in good shape. We're actually slightly ahead of where we are. So let me do the stop share and stick around like I always do for any questions anybody has about anything we covered now or any of you, well, late papers would be if you still need, I think everyone has the cover sheet, right? I sent that to everybody. Uh, but any question about oh, so extra credit, not too many people have done, but a couple people have started submitting extra credit but no one has more than I think 10 or 15 points so everyone still has plenty of extra points you could you know gain from submitting any of the extra credit options all right anybody have any questions about what we covered today or you know grades in general uh or or your, your papers specifically anybody now I have go ahead you first Victoria. okay um I was just wondering when will we get back our papers that um oh, just submit yeah um this weekend maybe sooner they're with a reader uh and since they're digital i sent them to this way but she's working full-time like so many people are too but a priority for her is she just left me a voicemail so i can tell you that i might have them as early as uh, thursday but more likely it'll be over the weekend, not Sunday night. So, so somewhere between Thursday and Saturday at the latest. I, I would guess by Friday, Thursday or Friday. 
you'll get them if you turn them in on time, of course, with an explanation of what grade you got and uh, you know the cover sheet or in fact something of it. Yeah, right. Which will have the points in each category. And I think your paper, the actual paper, will be attached. But of course, it's digital, so you guys have those already stored in your computers. But you'll get you won't just get the grade wrong points. You'll get a detailed explanation of how you did and why you, if you missed them points, how, how that was uh, determined and, you know, how the total points added up to whatever letter grade you get. But I would say by Friday, probably. Friday evening. All right. Question. Anybody else? That was also my question. <laughs> so, sure. Sure. All good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's reasonable. I tell people two weeks is a goal, but I can't promise that depending on how many papers I get there on time and how the reader schedules work out and how many I can grade. I'm grading some of them and so far I've graded just a few, but they've been pretty good. But that doesn't mean any individual can count on getting an A or a great grade, but it, it's a good sign. So far, so good. Uh, I can tell you that's that's an indication usually that any given class, I'm talking about from this class this week, has been focused on, you know, following the basic requirements and, and knowing how to uh, to, to meet those requirements. But if you miss a few points, you can make those up from extra credit. Again, that's an easy way to, uh, you know, in case you had like 10 points off and you wanted 100, or even if you got a B or C, and of course we're aiming, I assume everybody is for an A, it's easy to make up a few points. And then you'll know for the second paper, okay, I shouldn't overlook this for that item in the next paper. And then you have a much better shot if you did not the first paper get an A of getting an A in the second paper. If you are one of the people with the late paper, I already said this, but I'm not sure if we've been people going back and forth, joining and dropping off the Zoom session. I'm, I'm telling you it's the best for you to get it in if possible by this weekend, because uh, it gives me more time to grade it and get it back to you sooner, but also you don't get backlogged. And uh, then you also know if you might want to start doing extra credit if you don't get an A, because it's 10 points off from now on, it doesn't go up after that in terms of my late policy. Okay, and um, I am going to say there's a chance we'll have one of those super events. Well, for me, it is of a walking tour where we go inside historic buildings. I know the owners of some landmark, I do mean literally officially landmark designated homes by great architects of the last uh, 100, 130, 40 years. Uh, and uh, this class doesn't cover that, of course, but we're talking about uh, buildings that are really beautiful inside and you would never have a chance to see them. I'm friends with the owners because they've been in the books I've written about those buildings. If that happens, it'll be in late May before the final and it'll be worth 20 points for anyone who, who attends. It's called a walking tour. Some of you may have taken a few in some other parts of the area, but this will be in Berkeley on a Sunday. I'll let you know. I think the way Omicron is going, the, the, the numbers, let's see, but you'd have to get there on your own, of course. It's not a group event. I'm doing a walking tour, if I have one, for anyone who wants to join and you are invited. There is a small fee, but it's very reasonable. Not more than a museum fee would be. And you get 20 points instead of 10 for that because it's, it's a unique learning experience. I've done them for decades. And uh, people who've come to them have always said they really enjoyed them. And that will be on a sat Sunday, so a Sunday afternoon in May. I should know by mid-April whether we're going to do one of those. And you'll get an email as well as a, a live announcement if, if we do decide to do that. Okay. Well, once again, now's a good chance to ask questions um, that may be on the tip of your tongue. Uh, if not, then you know you can email me at any point. So so the next thing you'll uh, see from me will probably be those who turn the papers in, of course, on time. Uh, you're great and a summation of how you got the grade by the weekend, if not before. All right, anybody else have any questions, comments? Remember, extra credit is an ongoing option. You can exercise any time up through the exam finals in the week. I accept extra credit up until the end of the final exam. And that's, of course, on your syllabus. One more time, and last call, anybody have any questions? All right. I hope you found that interesting, some of these slides. Like I said, at least one of the ones you saw today will be on the slide essay part where you write short essays about them. We'll explain how to do that and how that's going to be graded and what to study and not study uh, one week before the week.
uh, midterm, right? Which is the midterm again is March 16th. All right, anybody else? Last call for questions. All right, thank you guys for everybody. All right. Thank you. Take thank care. you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Um, thank you.